afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us this uh, slightly blustery looking Wednesday afternoon. Um, this the third training session in our series of uh, online training sessions of provided by the Centre for the History of People, Place and Community at the Institute of Historical Research. Uh, my name is Dr Adam Chapman and I am uh, a member of the Centre and Principal Editor of the Victoria County History of England. And uh, I have, have to begin, unfortunately, with an apology. Owing to circumstances beyond our control, um, and indeed beyond Amanda's control, Amanda is had to withdraw from today's session at quite short notice. However, uh, so we will be able to reschedule her contribution and to discuss early modern litigation at a later date. And as and when um, we know precisely when that will be, we will let you know. Um, otherwise, we are very great. We are very grateful to Paul Driver for um, offering to amend his presentation at relatively the same short notice um, to include some of the stuff, some of the ground Amanda was going to cover about the National Archives and how to use it. So, uh, Dr. Paul Driver is the Principal Medieval Records Specialist at the National Archives of the United Kingdom at, and usually at Kew, but obviously at the moment not. Um, he is, among other things, President of the Lincoln Records Society and the, sorry, and the, Mortimer, and the Mortimer Society. Um, his interests are sort of geographically diverse, but local in focus. Um, Paul is uh, speaking to us today uh, in, his, in that capacity, and uh, we'll, just, we'll, discuss, we'll engage with and discuss the various medieval holdings that the National Archives hold, where they come from, and how to explore them using the catalogue of the National Archives discovery. Um, as I say, please remember that this uh, session is being recorded, um, so make sure that your microphones are off until the questions. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks for uh, your interest in medieval records in the National Archives. Um, apologies that Amanda can't be with us today. I've tried to cover a little bit of the ground that she would cover, but obviously Amanda is our most experienced record specialist, a real expert. So hopefully when she does return, reschedule her event, you can all join, join that. So I'm going to talk about basically how to navigate medieval records at, um, at the National Archives. And what I'm going to cover really is a lot of basic stuff in here. So bear with me if you know a lot of this stuff. So I'm going to start with kind of what are archives, how you how you understand and find records there, um, how to find collections relevant to your research, whether that be at the National Archives, in local and specialist archives, in libraries and special collections. And then I'm going to talk a wee bit more about online catalogues and what we at the National Archives call supplementary finding aids effectively things like original indexes, printed calendars, translations, that kind of stuff. But I'm really going to focus on sort of medieval and early modern records and antiquarian collections, mainly on government sources, but I'm also going to talk about the church because that's there's some crossover there. So first things first, just to make this clear, what the difference is between an archive and a library. So obviously you've all used a library I'm imagining quite a few of you use an archive as well. And a library is obviously arranged for the convenience of the user, whereas the archive isn't. Archives tend to be arranged to arrange their holdings by the creator and various functions of that, that creator has, whether that be a government or an individual or a, a group, and not by subject. So most archives also will hold primarily original documents where there is only one of that document, although of course, things like printed pamphlets in the early modern period can often be held differently, but it's the context of each collection, which again adds value and interest to any, even a copy. Where of course most libraries hold are primarily printed books. So 99.9% .9 of archive material is unique. But of course there, were, there are many libraries, particularly antiquarian libraries, university libraries, and museums which hold huge quantities of unique manuscripts or other relevant collections. And obviously archives, as we do, have uh, plenty of books. Now, the real key to understanding archives um, is to consider things like the context of creation. So you've got to understand the historic or the personal processes of which records are part of. And that tends to relate to function and sort of reveals the information they're likely to hold. So you can think, for example, um, that within the medieval state, there were several arms of government, the Chancery, which is the writing office, we'll come to that later, the Exchequer, the Financial Office, you have the law courts, you have various 
um, other offices of state um, which develop and they've got their own functions and those functions then generate records due to the interactions both legal and financial and secretarial that the government needed to um, fulfill and in terms of where archives are now you have to understand provenance so you have to to understand things like custodial history and transmission over time so how why is a particular record in the location it is now why why is it and also why is it being kept and why have other records not been kept or why have records that apparently similar are elsewhere not in a particular collection each record is tends to be located within a hierarchy and is created as part of as i say this historical process which then preserves that context. So really you're looking at a historical system. And it's important to remember, I think, that each archive, library, museum has its own collecting policy, which relates to its found, founding um, and its legal remit. And I'll come to what the National Archives is in a moment. So collections are generally accumulated by deposits from the founding institution and its subsidiaries, or occasionally private individuals. And although government tends not to purchase that many records, Purchase is also a key thing. I noticed the British Library, for example, I think purchased this week, what was it, a large Psalter of Edward IV, which, you know, is it will be an amazing thing for, for researchers to, uh, to be able to work on. So in theory, there should be no overlap between collections, but of course that never actually holds good in practice. And there are, there are strange reasons why things are in one place and not another. So the National Archives, of course, what we, we are effectively the official archive and the publisher for UK central government, but also for England and Wales. So Scotland and Northern Ireland have their own separate archival functions, National Records of Scotland, Public Record Office in Northern Ireland. So the modern um, records of those institutions go to those archives. Um, we're also the, um, the agency which collects and kind of secures it part of our part of our remit is to collect and secure the government record for the future. And of course, increasingly, that's digital now as well as physical. Although there's still a lot of physical comes in, we're now taking enormous amount of websites, digital files, that kind of thing. And our job is to preserve those for generations to come and to make it as accessible and as available as possible within um, archival and, and privacy legislation, information legislation. Technically, our paymasters are the Department of Digital Culture media and sport, although we're a non-ministerial department. So recently we've had to deal with the Secretary of State in terms of our closure and opening and restrictions during the, the pandemic. Uh, we're also the archive sector lead across England and Wales. So we offer advice and kind of guidance to other archives within England and Wales. And although we don't have any, we do have some regulatory function, it's not completely. But really sort of from a medieval period, medieval perspective, the the the, re, the the national archives collections go back essentially to the the medieval the royal medieval royal government doomsday book it's not the oldest record we have but it's the oldest government record that um <coughs> it's the foundation document for, for what we have and then realistically you're looking at sort of the late 12th century onwards is when record keeping in england royal record keeping starts proliferating and really then building over time, particularly in the 13th century onwards. Um, when I'm talking about records created in the Middle Ages, but I'm going to break this down a wee bit for you. So we're talking about records of government and the law. Now they can cover almost any aspect of life. And if you're interested in central government, so things like the Royal Secretariat, which is deals with all the correspondence, then you would need to go look at Chancery. And I'll talk more in detail about things like enrolments later and, that, and some of what we're calling the course of the seal. There's the financial arm, of course, which is the exchequer. Um, and that also actually, um, as Amanda would have told you, has um, oversight of some of these early modern courts, particularly the Court of Augmentations, which deals with the um, dissolution of the monasteries. And then you have the law courts. So you have the central law courts based at Westminster. So for the criminal courts, that's King's Bench. And then for the civil law, that's Common Pleas. But you also have justices itinerating around the country holding assizes and heirs and then creating plea rolls indictment files that kind of thing which are then sent into the center for both act action and then for archiving but outside of the central government you also have the local government of course and 
Really, you could find material relating to local government in the National Archives or often in county record offices. So think things like municipal records, like borough customers, court records, registers of civic government tend to be held locally. But things like shower administration, so sheriff's accounts, accounts of, accounts of a cheater who deal with land that comes to the crown, and records of local courts are often held nationally because those records have to be sent to the centre in order to enable national government to function. The church, of course, while not entirely separate in terms of record keeping, does generally have that separation. Um, so they normally deal with the spiritual and moral oversight of the population, as I'll come to later. And they, they have a variety of different things, such as registers of the bishops or archbishops. There are church court records which deal with moral and spiritual issues. State records of the of church lands, the church is also the administration until 1858 of probate. So if you're looking for wills of individuals, if you're looking for inventories, which give you a lot more detail about material culture in localities, then often church records are the place to go. And then there are things like monastic cartridges and registers which deal with you know, the administration of monastic houses over time until the 16th century, of course. Now, those records tend to be held at provincial and diocesan archives, which often overlap with county record offices, although I'll come to some of the provincial things later. And then you have for local, locally, you have those private estate collections. Now, generally, though, they, they tend to be in county record offices or still in the private hands. And the old, well, the old Historical Manuscripts Commission, which became part of the National Archives in 2003, has that function. So there's lots and lots of lists of private archives in um, with, 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 the, with the historical manuscripts catalogues. But if you're thinking of things like records of manners, things like court rolls, rentals, surveys, it will depend. Any manners which ended up being forfeited to the crown or its lands being taken into crown hands for a time, then often we have those records with us at the National Archives. And I'll talk in a little bit more detail later about what the manorial documents register is. So that differs generally. Archives generally differ there, whether they're local or central, from manuscripts and special collections. So these plate, these institutions are often art, they often hold artificially assembled collections, which are often those of a single individual. Collections can often have very diverse thematic or chronological range. And they also have different formats as well. So individual collectors often brought together, collections often brought together under a large umbrella, um, often university libraries or libraries. They could be by theme or they, they could be by individual institutions, whether that be academic or local and local government, that kind of thing. And it's not often as evident what the context and provenance for individual items often are, because sometimes, you know, private endeavor, private people purchasing over time or collecting over time. You can get back so far, but then you get to a certain point on where on earth does it come from. And then the, hopefully you can see this slide is quite wordy. <laughs> Apologies. There are other sort of literary, archeological and antiquarian collections, which are often in places like, you know, the Wiltshire Museum or the Society of Antiquaries of London, where you have a mishmash of things, which can often be literary sources, things like chronicles, annals, genealogical texts, or religious texts, legal treaties, that kind of thing. Think of the Wellcome Library, for example, they've got an awful lot of medieval material which relates to me medicine and science, uh, which we wouldn't class as records because they don't record transactions, but they are important nonetheless for understanding medieval life. But if you think about antiquarian collections, they often can still be the primary record because what they recorded in the 16th, 17th, 18th century no longer survives or is no longer easy to access. And for things like history, history of art, architecture, archeology, span place name studies, that kind of thing, you can find them across a wide variety of collections. And these include things like, you know, private estate deposits, whether that be land and landscape management, whatever that might be. You also have things like un unpublished antiquarian surveys or notes, you know, the antiquaries, William Stukeley, James Torr in Yorkshire, for example, though their notes are still out there. And they're still really relevant to local studies. Um, you often get, you know, church notes, which a lot of local record sites, of course, have published over time. Uh, but in terms of often government records, there are sort of 17th, 18th, 19th century 
transcript published published editions of transcripts of records before the public record office was founded which is our successor institute our predecessor institution in 1838 the uk record commission funded lots and lots of work in government records to actually bring together and then print and publish original um, archive material and thomas reimer is the most famous of those and he published his feeder various editions from the early 18th century into the 19th century. But then there are things on themes like monastic on Anglicanum, so English monasteries of England. Again, there's another six volume work. And then there are various journeys. So Richard Goff, William Camden, that kind of thing, is antiquarian journeys across England, recording, um, you know, standing stones, documents they found, things of interest. But we also shouldn't forget uh, modern collections as well, whether they be in personal or institutional archives. Things like photographic collections can often really give you an insight into villages, towns, buildings, settlements before um, modern industrial changes or modern planning law changes. And, you know, we lose a lot of the, the context and obviously, you know, wartime bombing, that kind of thing. But you can also find academic research notes and transcriptions of previous generations of historians, archaeologists, arch archivists, whatever that might be. So just to kind of reiterate here, just to, just to note that the National Archives deals really with records of central government and the central law courts. It does have private records which are deposited as evidence in court, often in the early modern period, which were never then reclaimed. Some of course have come to us through gifts and deposits. So if at the National Archives you ever see a, a series, uh, sorry, a document with the prefix PRO, that is actually public record office but that actually, that's actually not a public record. It's something that's come to us by gift. And is it often a transcript or something like that? With things like the, the transcripts of um, Venetian ambassadors from the 16th century comes into that, for example. But then if you I'm just thinking what were the, what the, 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 in the medieval period, for example. So if somebody pays to have a charter, imagine you want a charter of a market to set up a market in your village, you would pay the crown a certain amount of money, that, that sum of money would be recorded in central roles. The, the, the charter on which you would get your grant written out with the seal on the bottom would be sent to you. And they're often then kept locally because they would be part of an estate which ended up being kept locally. But the, um, the government keeps a copy of its records. So we would hold the enrollments as they're called. And I'll come to those in a bit more detail in a minute. But also you do specialist archives which deal with the records of the church and other private deposits. Sorry, there's me a little chancery lane built image there. Now, so the medieval system of royal government sort of has the king at the center of power. And so millions of surviving records are issued in his name and millions of course that don't survive. They're often authenticated with a seal because that in the medieval period, the seal, not the signature, is the means of validation and authentication of royal will. Um, initially, the king's court travels with the king to put his will into immediate effect. But as obviously the demands on the king and his government grow, numerous branches and offshoots develop through which it discharged all of its administrative, financial and judicial functions. And then government largely then becomes settled at Westminster, in Westminster Hall. Now the two principal departments of state were the Chancery, which is the Royal Writing Office, and the Exchequer, which is the Financial Office and Treasury. Now, you have to understand their workings if you want to attempt any kind of location or understanding of the records that they generated. And of course, they can cover almost any topic. Any topic you want to name, Chancery and Exchequer are almost certainly going to have something, and often in great volume. Now, there were, of course, many other great establishments of state. So the Royal Wardrobe, for example, sort of private robing area, which had lots and lots of the intimate functions of court and the law courts as well. But I'm really going to focus on the Chancery and the Exchequer in the next bit, just to, um, because they're the most important and most voluminous records. So if we start with the Chancery, as I say, that's the formal writing office and secretariat. And it produces enormous variety of documents under the Great Seal. And here you can see the Great Seal of Edward the Edward III from the 1360s. 
Um, so that's made in be made of beeswax, soft and dyed, and it's attached to the document with a little fold at the bottom, sewn through, or sometimes with a parchment tag, which is sort of put, put through a slit. That was your authentication. Now this is the Bretigny seal of Edward III, which was um, kind of cast after his um, agreement with the French in 1360, which brought an end to the first phase of the Hundred Years' War. Now these are really obviously beautiful artifacts, it's got real sort of heraldic messages in them. Um, and it was the Great Seal that was kept by the Chancellor, the King's sort of chief minister. And each seal was in theory broken at the end of a reign, or if they wanted to fashion a new seal for changes in government or status, that kind of thing. Um, you'll notice on this one, for example, that the in 1340, Edward III changes his heraldry. So the lions of England are then mixed with the, uh, the fleur-de-lis of France. And then from then on, of course, as we do today, we still have the fleur-de-lis on the, uh, the royal insignia. So the chancery is the, for, is the source of the king's formal instructions, and it produces letters, executive orders, treaties, commissions, that kind of thing. Almost any kind of business requires a writ. So if you wanted something, you had to have a writ to the chancellor to write up a document, which would be a grant or an order or a legal case, whatever it might be, or a specific instruction to a royal official. Uh, and the chancery also was the place where royal business and administration kept its records, including those for the council and later for the parliament. And during the 14th century, the chancery also takes on more of a legal function as a court of equity. So that meant that the chancellor heard cases that couldn't be settled at common law, and it brought evidence and fairness into play. So these are the records, in, in actually, over time, where you get a lot more English in them. So although principally records are going to be written in Latin or the, uh, the, the French that was spoken in England, once you get into the late 14th, early 15th century, these kind of equity pleadings, because often it's the force of the words that were spoken sometimes that are, um, are important, they are often written in English. That's where you really get the, the most bit of English coming in. Uh, Chancery, as I say, was also a repository and a legal registry where other sorts of records could be deposited for safekeeping. Now, they're not all medieval, but there are 284 different series of Chancery documents. So it's a massive archive. And kind of this vastness means that, as I say, it can be used to research all manner of topics. Uh, so these, are the, these kind of examples on the slide, you can tell you how rural government worked, what rural government did and gave, when and to whom, the kind of things people wanted from rural government and how much they were gonna pay for it. But it was also a place where transactions between private individuals were recorded. So it could be that you know two individuals were exchanging a piece of land and they wanted to make an agreement and evidence of that agreement recording sometimes the transaction can be found in Chancery. And it also equally for disputes between individuals. Now, the secret really to understanding and getting the most out of the Chancery archive is to understand what we call the course of the seal. Now, by the 14th century, an increasingly complex machinery of government had developed in which there were several steps in the process from the submission of a request to the king whether that be verbally or in writing or submitted in Parliament, for example, um, to the issuing of the final document, which then had the award, whatever it might be, um, or the gift or the commission, whatever it might be. Now, the remoteness of the king generally from Chancery as business increased and it was settled in Westminster, led to the establishment of a series of smaller seals, which were personal to the king to put his will into motion. Oops, sorry. Now, the Privy Seal, which is the private seal, that develops first, but by 1312, its business had increased so much to the point where a separate office had to be established for it. Then, of course, each king wanted a secret seal. He'd often wear it on the, on, you know, often on the, the ring finger or something like that. And that then, of course, gave very immediate force to the king's will. And that emerged really when the king wanted real private business, serial secret business to be transacted and to have that authentication. Now, ultimately, any of those seals could be applied to bills or warrants or writs, and they would move the larger seal. So you think of it as a sort of a, co a sort of a mill where you've got one cog moving another, moving another, until eventually the final product comes out at the end. Um, documents will survive from each stage in the process, but in the process you could bypass stages. So sometimes there'll be a warrant, but not an original request. 
Sometimes you only have the enrollment, whatever it might be. Now, imagine you want a favor from the king. So as I say, maybe you want to hold a market or an annual fair in your manor. So you might speak to the king and yourself and hope to persuade him, or you could petition the king, uh, you petition the council, or even for more serious concessions and plans, you could petition parliament. Now, TNA holds two vast series of letters and petitions which request royal favour. So the first, which one of you've got on slide here, is what we call ancient petitions. And that has the archive reference SC8. Now that's an artificial collection of around 17,000 medieval petitions requesting royal grace or favour. Now petitions can come from all levels of society and they can be individuals or communities. And they're often strongly associated with parliament, which was kind of the main forum for public airing of grievance. And this particular one deals with um, a request uh, from the community of Lincolnshire, but the, the city of Lincoln particularly, it's complaining about um, religious houses selling their wool at preferential rates. Now, the other series of letters is found in series SC1, which is cleverly called Special Correspondence. Now, SC actually stands for Special Collections, and they're real anomalies. They're not an original medieval collection produced by one office. They're artificially brought together in the 19th century. And this is where kind of, you know, we throw our hands up. They were often quite literally ripped out of their original context. And in particular case SC1, they're pasted into bound volumes. I mean, you would never conceive of doing it today, but the 19th century predecessors had no such qualms. Now it's often therefore impossible to work out where they came from and some are undated, some don't have addresses or you know, names of them. So a lot of it's guesswork. And around 12,000 survive and they're written in Latin, Anglo, Norman, French, and sometimes in English. Now you can find basic descriptions on, on Discovery Art Catalog, um, which I'll come to later. Whereas for SC8, the Ancient Petitions, a project by the University of York about 15, 20 years ago, has created really rich, detailed descriptions of those petitions. So there's an awful lot of material that you can find quite easily. This particular slide is quite a curious survival. So it's a letter from an individual called Richard de Clifton, who's a clerk, and he's writing to the Archbishop of York's treasurer and the royal clerk, Walter of Bedwin. He thanks him for his letters and of his gift of, as you can see here with a little um, box around it, table knives, which is in the middle of the third line, cultelos in Latin. So literally, either these series can tell you virtually anything. Now, assuming the king or his representatives were content to make the requested grant, whatever it might be, this then needed to be communicated to the chancellor so that the great seal, the biggest seal, could be affixed to the final document. Now that communication often, most often came through written warrants. Now these are written on small rectangles of parchment and they're kind of an intermediate stage in the process, but they can really give you extra information on the request or the reasons for its grant or not. And the main chancery series is this series C81 and they're arranged by category and they include things like warrants for the apprehension of monks and nuns who had fled their monastery, that kind of thing. So they're not arranged in chronological sequence. Now, the majority of warrants for the Great Seal were actually issued under the Privy Seal, which is the next one down. And there is another series of warrants authorizing documents under the Privy Seal. And that, surprise, surprise, is PSO1, Privy Seal Office 1. And those warrants aren't well catalogued at all, but um, the Chancery warrants in C81 were printed for the reigns of Henry III, Edward I, and Edward II around a century ago. And I'll come back to things like publications in a moment. So one final main set of warrants um, are those issued under the Privy Seal in response to petitions and bills submitted to the Royal Council. So the Royal Council had executive authority and it was comprised of senior royal officials and leading magnates. Now there's a record series called E28. They're not well described at all and there could still be many treasures to find there, but obviously you're gonna need your uh, Latin and paleography skills. They're mainly 14th to 15th century as well. So on the slide we have here, this is an example in the 15th century. It's actually a bill, so it's a petition to the king by, in this, in this case, Henry VI, for an appointment to be keeper of works in Nottingham Castle. So you can see on the kind of the second line of the main text, Nottingham is sort of three courses, eight tenths of the way down the, uh, 
down the second line. So you can see the body of the text is written in quite a neat hand, probably by a chancery clerk. But at the bottom, you can see the kind of the scrawlier hand. That's where it, uh, where um, the authorization is written. And it says, the king hath granted this bill. And it's written by somebody called Mr. Say, the Royal Chamberlain. Right, so, okay, so you've made your request. It's been granted and a warrant's been drawn up to the chancellor. Now what? Well, in theory, you should receive your document with your, with your grant on it, sealed with the king's seal, as you can see in this example from 1253, where Henry III grants Foot Bassett, the Bishop of London, a license to enclose one of his parks. Now, formally issued by the chancery, these documents are called engrossments, and they're what you as the recipient of the grant would, would have as your proof of a particular grant. And if you ever needed to litigate and to prove your title, this is how you would often prove your title, by showing the original document with its seal attached. Now, as you can imagine, the survival of these documents in private hands, particularly over centuries, has become uncertain. And obviously far fewer original engrossments survive than were issued. So, for example, lots and lots of market charters and fair charters don't survive in the original. It's only where you've got really, really solid record keeping practices, often in big cities, um, that you actually find that kind of thing surviving. But never fear, for from the reign of King John in the early 13th century, the Chancery routinely kept a record of its grants and outgoing correspondence. So once a document's been warranted and engrossed, it's usually copied out in abbreviated form, together with other entries of a similar date onto sheets of parchment called membranes. Now each sheet could have writing on both sides, and it would be sewn at the top and the bottom and then kind of rolled up. And that's known as chancery style. But if you imagine how a modern sort of toilet roll is, is curated of sheets, Adam's laughing, but that is it, it's it, it's a toilet roll, effectively. So each roll represents a different type of document. So there are, you know, and within each roll, there are entries that are marked off from each other by a little paragraph mark or something like that. But unlike a book, there's no real other means of reference. So if you were trying to find something in one of these roles and didn't have another means of reference, you'd be scrolling through going, oh, you'd have to be navigating by date. It'd be, it can be very difficult. Now, the key things to note about those are the entries are usually written in heavily abbreviated but formulaic Latin. So once you've understood the formula, you can actually navigate them and take out the bits you don't need and just concentrate on the bits you do need. Though you can find exemplifications or inspections of earlier documents in French. And actually some of the earlier roles even have some of the, the, the either the original charters or the spurious charters from Anglo-Saxon, you know, pre-conquest England, um, often mon monastic ones. So they're drafted by chancery clerks who are trained to use a similar handwriting and a similar type of abbreviations, sort of the chancery or the court hand. Each different type of role is organized by regnal year or part of a year as the business gets bigger, but it's not always chronologically written in a particular year. And the thing to really remember is that these roles are written up and they survive now in reverse chronological order. So as you open a role, the first entry you come to are those that are going to be closest to you in time. So if you take the reign of Edward I, for example, Edward I comes to the throne on the 20th of November, in 1272, which is the date of his accession. So each role runs from the 20th of November one year to the 19th of November the following year. So if you wanted to find a document dated the 1st of December, you'd have to go almost certainly all the way through the role to the end. But if you wanted to find something, let's imagine on today's date, the 18th of November, which is fortunately the penultimate day of Edward the first regnal year, you'd probably find it on the first member and you got to. You'd be quite lucky. I end up, ended up having to go to like membrane 35 a lot of the time, which is very annoying. But that's kind of how they're, how they're done. Um, now, the copies that which are enrolled are often drawn up from drafts. So where they survive, you might find possible discrepancies between the engrossment and its enrollment. Not very often. Clerks, of course, often enroll things in the wrong places. And then there are a system of abbrevi abbreviations which tells you what the warranting authority is. So you'll often find per ipsum regem, which is by the king, or per breve de privato sigillo, something like that which is you know, by writ of privy seal. It's quite complicated, but the more you get used to it, the more advice you get, you'll, you'll be fine. Now, in terms of enrolments, 
of the 284 Chancery series, 28 of them are medieval enrolments, and they're arranged by the type of document that's been copied. So as you can see, there's a role for the most formal of grants, which are charters. There's a role of fines, which is not judicial penalties. It's actually those paid to the king for um, grants, whatever, or favours, that kind of thing. So if you think of a medieval fine, a fine is not something you have to pay because you've done something wrong. It's something you pay because you want something from the king. Immersement is what they normally call the judicial equivalent. Um, uh, there are also two roles for the enormous number of letters issued by Chancery to officials for action. Those that are issued patent, which are those letters that were originally written on squares of parchment and sealed and then issued open, which are really deal with material that should be publicly proclaimed, uh, which would be, say, like a grant of a royal office. So imagine I'm making Adam Sheriff of Middlesex. The whole community of Middlesex needs to know. So they're issued patent. However, if I want to give Adam some oaks in, in my forest, the only person who needs to know really is my forester. So I would issue that closed, sealed shut, and, and the recipient then breaks them open. And that's what letters close are, really. It's pr more private business. Now, chancery enrolments tend to be the best reference documents in the government archive. Um, the problem is, you won't find anything more than a reference to the role itself on our catalogue. And that's because in the late Victorian era and the Edwardian era, my predecessors at the old public record office prioritised the publication of very extensive, richly indexed English summary translations uh, called calendars of a lot of these roles. Now, they're available at lots and lots of archives and libraries, research libraries, universities, that kind of thing. And they're probably, I would say, the most invaluable research tool out there. Now, many, of course, are now out of copyright and can be searched on things like the Internet Archive, Hattie Trust, that kind of thing. Or, and Adam hasn't bribed me to say this, you do get a few for, I think, Edward I reign, for example, on British History Online, which is one of the IHR's online products, which I think is free at the moment, is it? Is that right? Can't, anyway, you can come to that later. Right, the good news is, of course, that the summaries in English are often more than sufficient for your research. So you might only need to check the originals if you suspect a mistranscription, or if you, for whatever it might be, wanted to check the original wording in Latin. Also note that three individuals, Herbert Sweetman, sorry, Henry Sweetman, Joseph Bain, and Garon Wee Edwards, published calendars of documents extracted from those roles relating to Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. And they're really good as well. They're really, really expertly done. Uh, now, more modern research projects have been able to digitise, edit and make searchable certain key series. So from my perspective, I was one of the research assistants on the Henry III Fine Rolls project, which published digital editions with the images of those roles on which individuals made fines the king for grants and favours in the 13th century. Adam, I think, was involved with the Gaskin Rolls project, which deals with, as you can imagine, business relating to England's dominions in southwestern France, corresponds right to those. Um, both of those sites are free and you can navigate them and you can move between images and um, translations. And they're also really good if you want to improve your paleography or if you want to work out how documents are structured, the kind of words that are used, if you're you know, beginning to get into them in more, uh, more depth. Now, moving on from the um, from the Chancery, the other great organ of state is the financial arm, which is the Exchequer. Now that's kind of a, an institution which came from Normandy and it really started to be, to be brought together in the early 12th century. But as an institution, it really starts to solidify throughout the 12th century. And by the end of the 12th century, you have an, you have an institutional manual kind of called the Dialogue of the Exchequer, which really gives you details about how royal finances were arranged. Now, the Exchequer is the place where royal officials and royal debtors come to render their accounts to the Crown, and it's also where debtors and litigants involved in cases with royal revenue or debt came to plead. And it was also the home to the Royal Treasury as well. So the Exchequer, like the Chancery, but slightly earlier, becomes more or less fixed at Westminster by the end of the 12th century. Um, the Exchequer processes accounts throughout the year, but sheriffs and royal bailiffs came twice a year, 
at Michaelmas, so sort of early October and Easter, which is obviously a more movable feast, to submit their accounts and hear the audit. Now, to navigate your way around the records produced and archived by the Royal Exchequer, you have to kind of understand a little more about how it functioned. So in the diagram on the bottom right of the slide here, you can see the various functions that the, the Exchequer has. And each of those functions was fulfilled by one or more parts of the Exchequer, and each of those um, produces its own discrete set of records. So from the accountant's point of view, the accountant arrives in the lower exchequer, otherwise known as the exchequer of receipt. And that's where officials would first arrive, they deposit their money, their tallies, their documents. But it's also where money is issued out of the exchequer as well. And then the upper exchequer is where the audit process takes place. On the previous slide, the sort of the little square table there, the exchequer comes from the Latin scaccarium, which is also the word for chess as well. And you can see like the checkerboard on which the account, as it's being seen here, is being heard and processed. And individual piles of money with different denominations are put on different squares, depending on the coinage. Uh, so the upper exchequer, as I say, is, is also the place where you, um, questions related to rural revenue are examined and determined. Now, within the exchequer, there are four main types of documents, a bit like the Chancery. So each accountant would submit what are known as particulars of account, which are those rolls or writs or tallies and receipts which are then submitted for audit. So they're often still found, amazingly, in the leather pouches in which they're transported. One of the great pleasures of actually, you know, just ordering up one of these documents is actually you find the pouch and the documents are still in the pouch that they were in. And often there's writing on the outside of the pouch too. It can be a real kind of non-textual pleasure that you get by working in archives. Um, now, the majority of those particulars of account in the Exchequer are found in every medievalist favourite series, E101, which stands for Exchequer Accounts Various, and it is very various indeed. You can have, they, they're sort of done by kind of theme in this case, and you get things like army, navy and ordnance, forests, Jews, messengers, royal wardrobe and household, Scotland, that kind of thing. Now, usually those particulars, oh, sorry, I'll go back one. Those particulars are written on rolls that are in the chancery style. So weirdly, they are also like the toilet roll style. And they provide itemized um, evidence of receipts and payments with all the sums as you can kind of see in the very bottom of the slide on the right hand side with the Roman numerals. So this one here is an account of the Irish Exchequer from 1318 to 20. And you can also see just vaguely, there's a vertical line drawn right down the middle of the document. And that was the Exchequer's mark of enrollment to prove that that document, the records in that particular document had been written up onto a central role, which would then be used for the audit process. Now, one of the most important, particularly for local history, really in England and Wales, and also in readily searched series of exchequer particulars of account are those in the series E179. And that deals with the full range of taxes and subsidies granted to the King by the laity and the clergy, usually in parliament or convocation, um, and those records can be really diverse, but they contain a wealth of financial information and they're a good gauge of the Crown's ability to raise money. Now, the rolls are stuffed full of names of householders, taxpayers and immigrant communities often arranged by parish. The one thing the database doesn't allow you to do, it will allow you to search by place, but it won't allow you to search by name of individual. So if you're looking for an individual in a particular place between, let's say, 1200 and 1690, you have to search by place and then order the original record up to look at. But when you do a search for a particular document on here, you can, it helps you navigate the original because it's, they, the, the, each document is described and it gives you the membrane by membrane rundown of which places are mentioned. So if you're looking for something which it says is on membrane three, it's very easy then to find with the original in front of you. Well, more easy, I should say. Now, taxation of um, records and letters patent of denization have also very recently been mined to produce this amazingly fully searchable database of recorded immigrants into England in the late medieval and early Tudor periods. So it's really worth getting to know, and there's really good evidence for immigration into the North from Scotland, there's immigration from Ireland, there's lots and lots of immigration from Northern Europe and further afield. And it's a really, really important resource which adds a lot to the taxation records database I've just mentioned. 
Now, apart from those particulars of the Crown, as in Chancery, there are writs and warrants which drive the various processes. But unlike in Chancery, those warrants were usually to issue money. So if you want to trace individual payments, one option is to explore the Warrants for Issue series, which as you can see here is the reference E404. One of the most common records in that series are wardrobe debentures, which provide details of expenditure that doesn't always survive elsewhere in the domestic department of royal government. And these, as you can imagine, contain a wide variety of information on the royal buttery, gifts, arms giving, knights fees, wages in war, that kind of thing, household of the king's children, um, crown jewels, necessary receipts and loans, robes, all manner of things. Uh, it's also a great place to trace the career of um, clerks in royal service. Now this one, as you can see, is a warrant for payments towards Edward IV's coronation in 1461. The one other thing to note is these are quite ephemeral in nature. They're not really particularly neatly written and they're often on scraps of parchment. So how many of them survive, we're not really sure but they are indexed in two volumes produced by the List and Index Society, so you can at least start to navigate them from the comfort of your own library. Um, now, there are various other roles, which, which I'm not gonna mention, things like receipt and issue roles, which document the payments coming into and out of the Exchequer. But one other key kind of process is the audit process. So accounts are processed throughout the year, and then as they're being processed, two officials called remembrances compile roles of memoranda as issues arise. Now, those are some of the most informative financial records, but they're not catalogued well at all. You only get the, the role reference, but they're really highly structured. They've got various different types of sections on letters, patents or bonds for debt, for example. And you can find, as I'm going to come to later, extensive images of those roles on the Anglo-American Legal Tradition website. And a lot of what materials in there is unknown, really. It's another one, it's one of the last great medieval records series to be almost totally unpublished. Now, finally, you've, you've, you've made your request, you've had your warrant produced, now what happens? So a, a payment's been issued. As a final step, the upper exchequer produced large rolls which record the summarized details of audited particular accounts at the end of the exchequer year. So the main account is the pipe roll, so-called, amazingly, because it was made up of large skins of parchment called rotulates, each of which are sewn at the, just at the top, and you use them a bit like a flip chart, it's like a massive flip chart. Now, that records county by county the accounts of the sheriffs for rural revenue um, and other royal bailiffs like constables of castles or keepers of customs. And in the 14th century, discrete exchequer functions were separated off onto other roles of, for example, taxation, wardrobe and household, and what are known as foreign accounts, which those which kind of summarize the miscellaneous particulars and they're not germane to the county accounts. Now, what else is there? If we move into records of medieval church, society, that kind of thing and landscape, we're moving away a bit more from the government records now. And we're gonna talk about um, how, if you want to find out more about popular belief, priestly behavior, church management of land and estates, architecture and engineering, shrines, pilgrimages, material culture, that kind of thing. There's a wealth of information um, that you can find in other sources. Just to really, really, you know, scare you, here's a great slide of the hierarchy of church administration. I won't go into that in detail, but you can just see how complicated things are. And each of the little blocks will, will create records as part of their functions, um, part of their business um, administration. Now, the main kind of the pinnacle of the record sources that are created by the medieval church are the archbishops or bishops registers. And again, these are really, really diverse in terms of content. You can get everything from ordinations of priests and their institutions and their dispensation to preach that kind of thing to things like, you know, a bit like the Royal, the royal Archives, you get um, copies of letters coming in and out, um, Royal Writs, you get stuff relating to dispute resolution, clerical taxation. You also have records of visitation. So when an archbishop or a bishop goes out and visits religious houses and, and assesses the moral and spiritualness of those, those individuals in those, those places. 
as I mentioned earlier, you also get testamentary business and you get a mass of miscellanea. Now, from the, the earliest bishops registers are actually in roll form and they come from the early 13th century. And really it's only into the 14th century you start to get bishops registers in much more, much more volume and spread across the diocese. Now, as I say, they're the pinnacle of diocesan records and they're often found in the county and or diocesan record office, which is usually also the bishop's seat. Now I put this in because I'm from Lincoln, but Lincoln, of course, as you'll know, is the seat of the largest bishopric in medieval England. And actually, if you're looking for church affairs in Huntingdonshire, parts of Leicestershire, parts of Nottinghamshire, Bedfordshire, Oxfordshire, down to the Thames even, you actually still need to go to Lincoln to look at the, the registers there. Lots of other dioceses, of course, are kind of contiguous with modern counties or just spread over a few counties. Winchester deals with like Hampshire, Surrey and parts of Sussex, for example. Those will also hold, and if you're thinking about medieval buildings or fabric, that kind of thing, they often hold the modern diocesan business, which includes things like administration of faculties. So where a church applies to put in a heating system in the 19th century or put in, you know, knock down a church tower because it's dilapidated. And they can often give you, you know, plans of new buildings, discussions in parish council, that kind of thing about the medieval, if you want, or the early modern. Um, now, at the top end of the hierarchy, of course, you've got the two archbishoprics. Archbishopric of Canterbury, their materials in Lambeth Palace Library in London. The Archbishopric of York has its material at the Borthwick Institute for Archives in York, which is now part of the University of York. Not all registers have survived, and many which do are printed, were printed in the 19th century by local record societies, but there's actually a society called the Canterbury and York Society, which exists to, to publish editions of um, medieval bishops' registers. There's also an indispensable guide by David Smith, who is the great historian and archivist of Episcopal administration. And you can see what that is on the slide. If you're looking at things like cathedral archives and libraries, things like registers of Dean and Chapter, Chapter Acts, that kind of thing, various deeds and endowments, fabric accounts, they're often with the diocesan records in um, those individual um, county and diocesan um, archives. Although some cathedrals still hold their record in Canterbury Cathedral, of course, still holds its, its I think most of its archive. Uh, just to say, because this involves me and Adam mentioned it, I'm co-investigator on a project called the Northern Way. So the registers of the Archbishop of York have been digitized all the way through from 1225 to 1650. You can see um, images, really good high quality images of those records. And as part of a project called the Northern Way, we're now indexing and providing short summaries of the records from the 14th century archbishops. So those of you that have any interest in the nor in Northern England, um, particularly in church life, um, institutions to particular parishes, whatever that might be, monastic houses, that's now a really good new resource, which we're building all the time. And again, just to scare you, we're moving into church law now. So you can see that there are various different courts um, in the ecclesiastical hierarchy. And each level has its own function, it creates its own records and it tries its own cases. Each is the kind of the appeal for the other until of course you get to the 16th century when Henry VI decides to uh, play silly buggers, maybe not. Um, and he creates the Curia Regis as the great um, court of last resort with the High Court of Delegates in the 16th century. York has its Chancery Court and um, Canterbury has its Court of Arches. And here is the only surviving evidence of a consistory court in England in Chester Cathedral. It's a really amazing place to visit. Now, the church um, courts produce what are called cause papers. Each individual trial was called a cause. And you can see just examples here. And they are, these are really, really interesting, fascinating records, coming in a massive um, range of material, generally moral and spiritual. So things like marriage litigation, which is where you find things like adultery, sexual malpractice, reputation, things like defamation of character, and also witchcraft, that kind of thing. More mundane records like tithe payments and taxation, and upkeep and regulation of church property. You have the sanctity of sacred spaces, so you know the sp spilling of blood in churchyard, or you know driving cartloads of dung through churchyards, that kind of thing. Uh, and then also you have testamentary disputes, probate business. Um, so if, you want, if you've got a will, 
and you want to find out more, you can often find there has been a, a case if it's been disputed in cause papers. And in terms of where to find those records, it's kind of the same pattern as before. So most diocesan courts, they're in the Canterbury Record Offices. So the Archbishop's Courts, again, Canterbury's and Lambeth Palace Library, and then Archbishop of York as the York's Archbishop's Prerogative Court uh, for probate as well at the Borthwick. However, the difference is, and this is key for the National Archives, the Prerogative Court for probate for the Archbishop of Canterbury is actually in the National Archives. So the will registers and probate inventories, or, um, original wills, uh, administration uh, books, that kind of thing, they are at the National Archives. Now, the will registers are searchable and downloadable via discovery. And I'm sure Amanda will tell you this, but be careful when you search the series Prob 11. There are some 19th, 20th century indexes to the testators. For some reason, about 20 years ago, when the National Archives digital catalogue was being put together, they decided to re-index those records and they made a complete horlicks of it. If you can't find a test data that you know made a will or you're pretty sure is, it will almost certainly be because the modern transcription in discovery is wrong. And I say that not because I, you know, I'm not cr criticizing my own institution, it's just a fact. And there are there are lots of errors that were introduced during this about 20 years ago, this re-indexing. If you're looking for course papers, there is only one resource to go to. That's the York Course Papers Project. But that, of course, only deals with York itself. If you're looking for other dioceses, you are at the moment going to have to be reliant on original records or printed transcriptions. And just a quick word on monastic archives. Obviously, there are an awful lot of materials, kind of cartridges, Richard compilations of deeds or record of endowment, that kind of thing. There are original deeds which survive in lots of places. You've got accounts of monastic officials, monastic libraries, that kind of thing. There's a vast array of texts that are once that, that have now once been preserved, that are now preserved, sorry, in libraries. Now the location of records was conditioned by the dissolution and it was defined by government and personal activity. So obviously if a monastery, a monastic house, had its muniments sucked into the court of augmentations in the 16th century as part of the dissolution. Those records tend to be at the National Archives. If not, they're often in private collections. And there's a really good online resource called the Monast English Monastic Archives, which is, is kind of a, a way to find out where, where particular collections relating to particular religious houses are. Now, the National Archives, just to touch on us, there are two main series, um, which are both miscellaneous series, annoyingly, classically. There's an Exchequer miscellaneous series and a Chancery miscellaneous series, and they contain a wide variety of things, things like appointments to ecclesiastical office, pensions and corridors, taxation, church property. There are some visitation material, there are indulgences. But as a general rule of thumb, we, the National Archives, tend to hold records where the secular meets the spiritual. So it's records related to church land and property in government hands, taxation, clerical petitions. It's not great for parish church administration or for like the moral and spiritual side of life as a kind of general rule. Right, so this is the bit that I think Amanda was gonna was to talk to you a wee bit more about now. I've talked more about, I've, I've finished my bit about sort of the medieval collections now. So we're now gonna talk about how you find things at, at, at the National Archives particularly now when you have to find things remotely, when you are thrown back on what's online. Um, our online catalogue is called Discovery, and this is the home page. And you can see there are various sort of things you can look at. So you get um, the middle bit is search the catalogue that takes you to, as you can imagine, the catalogue search. But I wanted to emphasize there are lots of research guides on all of the different topics that we have from medieval to modern, um, they're really, really informative. They're written by experts, by my colleagues, record specialists, and they kind of guide you through step by step. And in some cases, in quite complex detail, um, some of the research guide, uh, some of the, the major collections by theme that we have. And then there are various online collections as well that relate to our holdings that you can access. And I'm not talking there about the commercial providers like Ancestry or Find My Past. There are things you can download from our own website. 
really the, what I want to emphasize is that you can use the catalog to learn then as well as find. It's not just a search tool. You can actually use it as a research tool as well. Now, imagine you want to search for something. Here is our search portal with this sort of the search bar there. You can bang in whatever you want your, your search term to be. But what I want you to be aware of is that there are within discovery, there are descriptions at file level, basically some of the lowest level generally for records at the National Archives, but also 2,500 other archives in the UK. Because in about 2002, the National Register of Archives sucked in lots of material from other um, repositories around the country. That was frozen there, so we're not updating it. So any, any archives which have taken collections in or updated their catalogue since then, you won't necessarily find through discovery, but you'll find lots of, lots of legacy stuff from county record offices and libraries around the country. You'll also find, and this is important for those of you looking at local manorial histories, the Manorial Documents Register, which is, as it says on the tin, a register of those documents held nationally, locally, and privately, which relate to manors across time up to 1925, I think. And they can be searched by county. And as I understand it, the final counties are being completed at the moment, and there's going to be a big new launch in 2022, where there's going to be lots of new resource thrown at this, and it's going to be a really important a new set of finding aids for people who are looking at their local history at the manorial level. Now one thing to, again to stress that in our catalogue for the medieval and early modern period is lots of the descriptions are not new descriptions, they are inherited often from the, the institution which deposited the records. They're often brief, they're often quite short and concrete, they often relate to past functions, they're not thematically written. They often don't contain names or places, that kind of thing. Uh, they do, however, contain lots of variant spellings and contemporary dating practices, which I'll come to uh, in my next slide. So it's important, I think, not to be too conceptual. And I'll return to that in a minute. So important things to remember are that for pre-modern records, which I would say is anything from sort of 1750 and back, is that lots of collections are dated by in, and, and searched by, by regnal years, and those are poorly expressed at the moment. You can search by modern dating, but actually looking at the catalogue, there are often regnal years in there. Records, of course, in the medieval period are often dated according to saints' days or by law, law terms or return days. And so it's not, you, you know, you have to get your mind ahead into the, the medieval dating practices. And of course, calendar years tend to have been silently modernized. So as you know, up to 1752, the year begins in on the 25th of March, uh, late today, the Feast of the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So imagine you have a date, which is, I don't know, the 4th of February, 1352. To us, that would actually be the 4th of February, 1353, because, you're, you're dealing with the old style, not the new style dating. So any document dated between the 1st of January and the 24th of March before 1752, you add a year on. Also important to say that there are enormous numbers of variant names, variant spellings and variant terms. Um, collect as many as you can and use them. Many, of course, are captured in indexes and of calendars, antiquarian works, place names, society volumes, that kind of thing. TNA descriptions are not standardised, that's important to emphasise, and they've been created over centuries as indexes and catalogues have been converted. So often we would retro convert, we digitise an old catalogue and we tend not to update the data sometimes. New full cataloguing projects will update the data and they will give you the variant spelling where that's given. But they often, they often don't. And just also think um, that the most important thing, a piece of advice I would say to you is ignore the big search bar, pretend that's not there, and concentrate on the little, the nicely hidden advanced search function, because that's the best way to find pre-modern material at the National Archives and in other collections. And if you click on advanced search, this is our advanced search screen, and you'll see that you can restrict your search by dates to an individual year or to a date range, 
you can restrict it to just searching our collections or the whole collections. And then you can search various words, exact words or different types, different variations of words. You can even ask it not to search for words. And you can also, if you know how our references system works, which I'll come to in a minute, you can put in a reference in there. So you're taking out lots of extraneous material. So imagine as we've done here, you do a search for Charterhouse. This is the results page. And you can see on the right here, you've got your results. At the top, it tells you you've got 624 records and it tells you you've got 12 record creators. And the record creators are kind of the institutions or individuals um, which created the records and then they have been separately listed and under each one you can you can find the collections that are germane to them. So you can see here on the left the top arrow tells you how many of those 624 records are held by the National Archives, how many can be downloaded and how many are held by other archives. And it also tells you with the other arrow what kind of filters you can apply. The only filter you can see here are date filters but you can also filter by record series, by um, date of accession, if it's a modern record, you can still to buy Department of Government, that kind of thing. And each of those hyperlinks there is something you can click on and that takes you to a document description page. The one other thing I'd draw your attention to is at the very top of the search results, you have a drop down list, which where at the moment it's set to relevance. It should really say irrelevance, but that's not, it's more algorithmic. If you click on that, it allows you to search by date, whether ascending or descending, or it allows you to search by reference or by title of record. And it's a much better way than relevance is. Just to the right of that drop down box, you can see where it says export results. So if, as in this case, you've got hundreds of results to go through, that will allow you to create your own spreadsheet of records at the National Archives or elsewhere. And you can then use that as your own reference work for your own research. Now, each reference series, each reference at the National Archives is, co is constructed of three elements. It has a letter code at the start, which is its Department of Government, so in this case, E for Exchequer. At the bottom, you have CP, that's the Court of Common Pleas. Then there's the series number, which is randomly um, given as, as part of the divisions of each, um, each function of the, the department. In this case, E322 relates to surrenders, monastic surrenders in the, um, the dissolution period. And then the final reference is a peace reference, and that's the orderable unit. Now, it looks simple, E322 slash 133, but you can get some horrific ones. And so you've got the, the ones here where you've got dep depositions in the Exchequer, which of course, because the Michaelmas term of the reign of Elizabeth went over both her 44th and 45th regular years. You have to um, deal with that. And then you can see here, the, the one at the bottom is feet of fines. I mean, that is terrible. And you've got to put all that in to get the catalog to get you to the right reference. If in doubt, just ask us. We'll try and help as much as we can. But just, just a, a tip, where you've got E-L-I-Z-I there, it's no good putting Elizabeth the first, no good putting E-L-I-Z one, that won't work. It's a Roman numeral one, which means you've got to put I in. And it works the same for James, so J-A-S one, whatever. It's perverse, but that's how we've done it over time. All departments kind of have monomic, uh, monomic letter codes. So they're kind of intuitive, C for chancery, P for probate, S for state papers, that kind of thing. But not every institution has its code and it's normally the code of the transferring department. <coughs> and you'll learn that information as you use and order more documents. Now, when you click on a document description hyperlink, this takes you to the individual page for a particular item to order. So you can see in the bottom right, you can actually order that now. And if you're in the reading rooms, it would take about 45 minutes to come to you. At the top, however, you have the document hierarchy which allows you to see where in the hierarchy of the exchequer this particular record um, belongs. And you can see, you can click into each of these. And so you can see that there is a subseries of um, Court of Augmentation and Surrenders of Monastery dealing with London, in which this one sits. And the Court of Augmentations itself sits within the records of the Court of Augmentations Augmentations Office, which was subsumed as part of the exchequer. And each of those, if you click on them, 
has much more detailed information which you can explore and that will tell you a lot more about the context of records about their provenance who created them or acquired them and what, what they're for and you can also do that by browsing by, by browsing each of those so for example with our, in our example here you can't see it under the subdivisions but there's a details thing which tells you you can open up more details to tell you more about the cause of augmentation surrenders and then within that series on the right hand side if you were only interested in Coventry say you would click on Coventry and it would tell you what records relate to that within that particular series so it's quite I know I know people prefer the old way the catalog was created to browse but it's, it's okay once you get used to it. And then you can each of, you can go, as I say, you can go up each of the levels in the hierarchy and you'll find a lot more information. So here, for example, this, this tells you about the records of the Court of Augmentations. You can see on the left, the various different series, what they relate to and what numbers they are and what kind of documents are in them. And that's an immense amount of information there which links records and processes. Just a kind of word on hierarchy. Now, TNA, like most archives, has this seven level hierarchy, which relates to the department, the FONS, as it's called in archival terminology, which is the whole department. And then there are divisions within an department. Within each division, there's some series of records. Within each series, there could be sub-series or sub-sub-series. And then there are pieces and or items. Now, most archives use the word item to mean the orderable unit. The National Archives, it's piece. And a piece can have several items just to be annoying. Not every one of those levels is used in the hierarchy of any particular document series or document reference. And it's really important to understand that because as I said right at the start, context really affects meaning and also because archives can be huge. There's an awful lot there that's been brought together over time um, and describe them as a group. And so it's a real big time and money saver for you and for us as well. Obviously, a lot of descriptions are very sparing with their, inf in the, with their information. They're often given at the highest level. Discovery, while it searches across all levels, it can also search at any level you choose, but also the catalogs of their archives. And then there are those hierarchies, context and processes, which are really key to understanding. I and mean, it sounds quite heavy, but once you really start digging in, it does become clearer that you need to understand where something fits into the broader whole to be able to navigate it more successfully. <clears throat> so imagine you were looking for people. You could just stick in, you know, any search term, that'd be fine. You find any of these. And if you were to look for somebody as a record creator themselves, so if you were looking for everything that Geoffrey Chaucer for example, created, because of course, why wouldn't you? You've done a search here for uh, Geoffrey Chaucer, and you can see at the top, it says 18 records and one record creator. And if you click into that, it tells you, you can see why there's not everything on Geoffrey Chaucer is available. There's only one record, which is the Treatise of the Astrolabe at the British Library. Now there will, um, there will for example, be loads and loads of modern individuals. So, you know, imagine Winston Churchill. If you went into Winston Churchill, there'd be lots and lots of different collections, various different archives that relate to him, his papers. And we, for example, hold his papers as prime minister. But obviously Chaucer being in the medieval period, there's, there's not as much out there. Again, if you're looking at places, the, thing, the things to note here are that you need to think about how a place might have been written in the medieval or early modern periods, not just how it's written now, particularly if you're looking for surnames, or for smaller villages. Um, and then finally, if you're looking for subjects, what you need to think of here is of what terms would have been used at the time the records were created. And you can think, for example, that one man's martyr might be another man's traitor. For example, you might, if you're looking for magic in the early modern period, you might not want to look for the word magic, you might want to look for the words conjurers or sorcery, it just, you've just got to think the kind of things that the kind of terminology that would have been used at the time. Oops. Now, just to give you an idea, here is a single sheet charter, that's a piece. 
nicely written in Latin there, if I remember the first rain. However, this monster of a common plea roll, absolute monster, you're probably looking at seven, eight hundred sheets there with writing on both sides. That's also a piece. 100,000 names is an estimate, we reckon. None of that's available to search. You can't find anything on there. You've literally got to go through that yourself to find anything at all. But it's the same on the catalogue as the previous charter in terms of its level in the hierarchy. And that also applies to this little collection of early modern prize papers. So letters captured on board ships and dealt with in the prize courts. They're still in the often, there's a project going on at the moment to catalog those, but they're still found in these original bundles, still sealed. We're not going to break the seals in a lot of cases. Um, and, you know, that they are as they were in the 18th century prize court. But that's still one piece. All of that is, in fact, it's one eighth of a piece at the moment. Now, Discovery of the Catalog itself has 20 million descriptions. And I don't think it's hyperbole to say it could grow to 200 million without describing every single document. There are millions of items, particularly from the medieval period, actually, that are nowhere near the catalog description at the moment. And with, there's no resource to do that. There are only three of us, for example, in the medieval team. Now, just to, to talk for a moment about other online resources, I've mentioned British History Online, which Adam might want to talk about himself later. But the National Archives has various different parts of its sites. So I've talked about the E179 database. We have a micro site on cabinet papers, which has searchable um, OCR text from the, the British cabinet from the 1910s to the 1980s. State papers online. So that's the early modern correspondence, which I'm sure Amanda will talk a lot more about if you go to her session. That's actually a subscription service most university libraries or some university libraries will have it but we have it for free on site at the National Archives, and that has calendars, descriptions, and original records, original, sorry, original images or microfilm images. And it's, it's a really good resource for early modern correspondence and basically just social, political, diplomatic life. Uh, one really interesting new development. So students at the um, Centre for Medieval Early Modern Studies at the University of Kent, during the pandemic, They've worked with their academics and their librarians to create this MEMS lib, which is actually an amazing resource, which I think a lot of you will find really useful in that it brings together lots of online resources, guide, tips on guides for various different, and it's not, so it's not just history, it's art, literature, um, architecture, that kind of thing, archeology, span but it's, it's kind of, it's directed at sort of MA and early career PhD students. So it's actually a really useful resource for anybody out there, not simply for those following an academic path. And I, you know, I think I'd advise you to have a look at it. It's brand new, so it wouldn't have been here a year ago for me to talk about. Just a kind of word on what kind of things you're searching on those online resources. Generally speaking, you're not searching full transcripts of records. There are exceptions, and you'll know that when you go on them. What you tend to be searching are original document descriptions, catalogues and indexes, and then even more indexes of catalogues or sometimes indexes of indexes, just to make it really hard. Uh, so it means you've got to use the general keywords such as subjects or place names, particularly for those early records. And as I say, think about how the record would have been described in context, and that's for person, place, and subject. And a lot of this is trial and error, unfortunately. One resource I wanted to flag up also, particularly for, well, actually for medieval and early modern, is something called the Anglo-American Legal Tradition website. Now, this is run from the University of Houston, and effectively their team of photographers have worked in the National Archives for the last 15 years, maybe. And all they do, they come in and they bulk photograph original records. Now, I'm going to start by my, my analysis of Anglo-American legal tradition by saying it's a wonderful resource and it's really come into its own at the moment. It's allowed academic researchers to continue their research and generate research at a time when they can't get into libraries. So I'm not going to not going to gainsay that in any way. What I will say, however, it's not an ideal resource to use. A lot of the images are poor quality. They're often blurred. There are often extremely poor document handling practices which are 
made available across the internet. Um, the navigation of the images is actually very difficult. I'm not going to say it's not a wonderful resource because it is, but I think you should be aware there are problems with it and that it's not the most ideal resource. And particularly, it's great if you've got a reference and you know what you're doing and you can read the records. If you're learning and you're trying to navigate your way around, it's almost useless. Sorry, rant over there. Now, the one other thing to say is what can you find that isn't online but does give you important information? Now, at the National Archives and at all other archives, you will find what we call supplementary finding aids. These are a variety of printed or handwritten indexes, digests, registers, some of which were created during the working life of the documents and therefore contemporary, so you will need early modern paleography in certain cases. Others are Victorian or Edwardian or more modern print publications. Others are card indexes created over time by various different hands. Um, and there is such a huge variety that I can't really give you anything more than a sense of what you might find, but they do vary in detail and accuracy as well. So be aware they exist and that, that, that they are really useful. Um, all archives will also have their legacy catalogues, some of which actually still act as their main means of reference, main, means of entry. So before our online catalog, everything was done on paper and thousands of series and their contents were published in what's called red lists. Now the information contained in the majority of those is now into discovery, but that's not totally been possible with lots of the pre-modern series. And what you actually get are these green notes. So if you're able to access the National Archives when you come when we, when we reopen again, and you're looking at early modern, actually any series, you don't really know what it is. Each of these printed series on the open shelves have this introductory note, which is marked off by green paper. And some of them are a couple of pages, some of them are 10,000 words, and they've got really, really detailed introduction to series. They tell you about the provenance, the context, um, publication details. Um, sometimes they go into really detailed process about you know, the government process behind them. They were written about 20, 25 years ago by my predecessors who are and were at the time, and they still are in many cases, the real archival experts of government. So I'm thinking here of people like Margaret Condon, David Crook, um, Bill Sherman, John Guy himself, Caroline Shenton, you know, they, they are, they're impeccably written. They're amazing resources, which if you're ever in the building, do take time to browse or even photograph for yourself. Um, I'm going to the end now. So I'll just sort of say what some of the current challenges are when using archives, particularly the National Archives. Poor document descriptions are, is what the main, the main hazard. Having an online catalog drives that keyword searching, but it does make those poorly described records almost invisible. Archival research is time consuming. There's no getting away from that. Um, and also, of course, lots of the records that we hold are now going off site and they're not necessarily being digitized before they go off site, for example, which leads to delays in productions. But our expanding collection of modern records means that's inevitable. And of course, records of the future are being created increasingly in digital formats which creates their own problem, particularly in terms of obsolescence of technology and access. Uh, just to note that if you are um, ser um, searching on our archive, uh, on, our, on our catalog and want to find the details of another archive, the full contact details can be found on the main page under the find an archive link. So just to kind of recap, the tools you, you really need for the National Archives are our online catalog, access to paper catalogs when we can provide it, online guidance, online resources, and those supplementary paper finding aids. But actually, I think, and the one thing I'd like to stress here is that staff knowledge is often key. One of the reasons for doing this kind of presentation is that it gets us known to you and that we are accessible via email, via our live chat service, and also in the building when we're reopened, you can approach our inquiry desks and ask us any question you like, and we will do our best to help. So that really is, finally, 
me done. So I know that was a long one, Adam, but I tried to cover a lot that Amanda wasn't going to cover. Uh, uh, that's absolutely wonderful, uh, Paul. Thank you. Right, me, Thank you so much. There's a, a really rich presentation, which uh, hopefully if you familiar with Zoom, there's a little on the reactions button, you can find a clap symbol, which uh, you right, may right, be right, Sorry, I just unshared that. Sorry to unshare that. Can you <laughs> now not, is, that, is that proper? Is that, have I unshared that? You have unshared it again, Paul. Sorry. Um, so thank you for that. I'm sure that people have some questions. There was uh, there was a couple in the chat which I'll come to in a minute. If anyone wants to, does anybody? There's also a raise hand function in the participant in the participants panel uh, under your own name. So, there's anyone who has a question? Please, could they speak? Could they raise their hand now? Yes, uh, Aidan Charlesworth, uh, I've unmuted you. Uh, thank you. Um... I was uh, a bit disappointed with what was said about alt. The uh, I know I'm con controversial on that. Sorry. I, I can understand the point of view. I, I regard myself very much as an amateur and a learner, and I, I've had quite a lot of difficulty with it myself. But I've been looking at just quite a lot. Yeah. Where does that fit into the archive stream, if you like? So mm -hmm. what, what the, the, the what you mean what what type of records are they all? Uh, yes, partly. You see, my problem is I'm researching in Westmoreland, the old county yeah. of Westmoreland, in an area that was uh, hunting forest. Yeah. Now the hunting forest actually seems to predate the Normans. Uh huh. So there are no records really <laughs> relating to it. No. There are no records relating to the parks because it, they weren't being licensed because they were too early and I had to do loads of research on it. Well, part of that research was trying to find um, court heirs. Well, I yeah. found out later on that there aren't any. Yeah, I don't know when the earliest Westmoreland heir is, but it's probably 13th yeah. century, I should think. Right. Well, that, 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 I mean, there are records, but they're not formal heirs, most of them, which is one okay. reason why I think I've been looking at just. But I don't know whether I'm justified or not. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of where we're going. Well, there so, are some... so what I've been doing is, is what you, you said. I've been looking at place. So I've, I've been going through uh, a, a lot on alt because I found it easier yeah. really than, than going to the archives to look through the roles and um, pulling out everything that I, I can find for Brough and Stainmore, uh, and then trying to transcribe that, yeah, and then brilliant. working on those as time sort of came up. Um, That's great but, work. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I mean, I couldn't honestly tell you, apart from the earliest air roll, what you might look at earlier than that. I mean, because obviously, I, I, I is, was it in Doomsday Book? Is Brough on the Stone or in Doomsday? No, 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 I didn't think it would be. No, there. no, no. no it's, it's a black hole. Yeah, I can imagine. Which, which, which is why I'm desperate to look at anything. <laughs> which is, which is why I'm also looking at alt. Um, but I'm, I'm a VCH volunteer at the moment, so I don't yeah, know yeah, yeah. I'm I was, was going to say, I, I meant because they're VCH Westmoreland. Is that Angus Winchester's crowd? Yeah, he well, did, but, yeah. but he was wrong. I had, I'd, 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 uh -oh. I had to pull him up. Uh -oh. <laughs> I had to pull him up on my area because he had, he had this theory about baronial parks. So I had to write an article to point out that in Brough under Stainmore, there were six parks, all oh. medieval, going from the earliest times um right up to the 1420s wow and 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 then they were still being referred to because there was a deer reservation being referred to in 1604 but the records are very scant yeah i mean I, I, I said, by, the, by the looks of it the earliest west westmoreland air i can find is 1256. i would yeah. imagine you're gonna have to be if where they survive it would be deeds of some kind that might be your best bet yeah. But obviously, I don't, without looking, without checking further. Well, I've, I've, I've gone through just about everything you can think of. Yeah, well, it may be that, of course, at that date, I mean, really, I mean, government, government record keeping in volume 
really only kicks in and sort of the end with the first train, which is the 12, 1280s onwards, yeah. probably, I'd say. Oh. Before that, it's development, and there's a lot of trial and error, I'll, and I'll a lot of what... records, just for example, Justice's records, each Justice often kept his own records. Yeah. He didn't have to deposit them, yeah. so they were often considered private, so that's why they don't survive in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've come across that sort of with other sorts of litigation where you have to follow up the judge, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question. Uh, sorry, sorry, Hayden. Sorry. Thank you for that. Um, there's a couple of questions. There's a couple of questions coming on the chat. Um, yeah, like one of which, one. one of which relates to discovery, yeah. um, which is, can you use a sort of fuzzy searching? In discovery, do you know, Paul? You mean you mean Boolean type stuff? Or? Boolean type searching, yeah. Yeah, you can do. Yeah, yeah. You can do yeah. and or or, or yeah. not. Yeah. That that that's something you can do. Yes. Okay. And um, are there any? Uh, Sir Rose asks, uh, can you recommend any published books on researching medieval records? Uh, I think the answer to that is. Is this England and Wales? What or... sort of record you want? Yeah. Um. I mean, there's, hmm, I don't know. I'm trying to think what, where the best, because a lot of course are to do with, hmm, I'm not sure there is a great guide to be fair out there. Not a basic guide anyway, I don't know. What would you say yourself? Um, it depends what you want, doesn't it, really? I mean, Paul yeah. Harvey's yeah. medieval mineral um, records is a good Yeah, I mean, there are for certain types of records. But there's a lot of thematic yes. ones, aren't there? Yeah, yeah. And I do happen to know that, yeah, I think there are lots of thematic ones. There isn't a broad, I don't think there's a broad overview, no. really. A lot of it's about, like Michael Clanchy's From Memory to Written Record, it's about yeah. how writing generated and how records were made, that kind of thing, rather than it being, yeah, sorry, I should have had a better recommendation for you. Hmm. Um, let's see. Uh, so, uh, John Tetterton asks, is there any finding aids the poll tax returns of the 1380s? There are. Well. So, yeah. Professor Carolyn Fennick, she yep. published a three volume guide, uh, what was it, 15, 20 years ago? I don't know if you can get the, the details up and get, get them and put them in the chat. But so, yeah, they are, they are, well, a list of names by, by county and by place are published in, in three volumes by Carolyn, Carolyn C. Fennick. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Good point. Oh yeah. Um, so one one other question came in, uh, which is it came in by a private question by accident. Is uh, can you search by ref documentary reference? Which of course you can. Yeah, of course you can. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's a, you know, if you found a reference in a publication, yes, you want to know exactly, a bit yeah. more about the document, you can just plumb the number. Assume it's in modern format, of course, which yeah. isn't always the case. I mean, some where it falls down are some of the older things, like yeah. the older VCA, older Victoria County histories, which kind of tell you what the record is, but don't tell you what the modern reference is. No, uh, and that's the problem with some of the material that's on British History Online, of course, yeah. in that uh, in that it's been put online straight from the original text as published in it might have been 1907, 1908, 1920. And of course, it records the usage that was in the published volume, but yeah. also the usage that was available then. Oh yeah, um, which is not, which if you know how those systems, those things have changed, is great. But of course, it's not always easy to work out. And, uh, Paul has yeah. Paul has received emails from me saying, "Is this the reference?" I think yeah, it yeah. is. Good. It's been very helpful, but um, that's something to watch out for. Um, the alphanumeric system is actually might not even be a hundred years old yet. It's around 1920-ish, I think. But. Yeah, so I think we, it's, it's getting up for its centenary, but not quite. I saw a hand from Bill Shannon, by the way. Yeah, Bill, uh, let me just unmute you, Bill. There you go. I, 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 I thank you very much. That was most interesting, Paul. I know you can't cover everything, but I spend most of my time at Kew in the, uh, the series of the Duchy of Lancaster. Oh, very good. And, which... Uh, I, and again, I just thought you might like to have a quick word about Duchy or Palatinate type um, records, which in many ways mirror the Chancery and similar yes, records. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so actually, funny you should say that is that we're just at the moment 
starting to put together a project on the capture books of the Duchy of Lancaster, which are really the, mm. they are the cartularies, mm. sort of the, all of the records mm. of the Duchy mm. of Lancaster when Henry IV mm. becomes king. But yeah, effectively, you're right. The duchy itself, which is the Queen's kind of private estate now, so any record at the National Archives which has a DL prefix is not a public record. Mm. And if you wanted to publish something from that, you have to have separate permissions. You, I mean, we can give you the, the form of words, but it's not the National Archives permission giving you. But yeah, so they do obviously their own enrolments. There are warrant mm. series in that, in the, the Duchy of Lancaster. Yes. Theory that, as well. I, and I, as you I, say, I, that Coucher, um, the, the great Coucher, um, project that, that I understand is just starting. I think uh, Lancaster University, I can see uh, one of my colleagues, Sally, Sarah Rose, is uh, in the room. And I think Fiona Edmonds is, is oh, yes. heavily involved uh, in that I'm, project. I'm yeah. talking to Fiona at some point tomorrow, I think. Or... Very good. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, Fiona is very much a uh, heart of yeah. the project. Absolutely. But it is, it, it is the most wonderful um, uh, 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 resource. Yeah. If you see yeah. the, the, you know, you sit in the, in the same room as this massive, great, great uh, work mm. of art um, oh, which yeah. is it also is a fantastic yeah. record yeah yeah mm. I mean, as, a, as a welsh historian lots of interest in the welsh march there's a lot of duchy of lancaster material Absolutely. which deals with yeah. yeah a lot of those sort of estates that came to the royal domain yeah. of yeah. henry the fourth yeah. 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 I, I mean it is worth we're saying obviously the duchy of lancaster is not about lancashire it's about 40 odd english and welsh counties yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely okay a uh, question from john matthews Yes, uh, when I looked at the manorial documents register in, in paper copy many, many years ago, it included reputed manors, i.e. ones that were said to exist, but for which there were no specific manorial documents. When I was looking recently online, these seem to have disappeared. Were, was I just looking in the wrong place or have they actually been stricken from the record? What I would say is I don't know because the Manorial Documents Register is, is, is um, administered by our archive sector development team. Mm. If you want to maybe send your details to Adam who can send them on to me, I can pass them on to, the, to my colleague Liz Hart who really is the administrator of the Manorial Documents Register. Mm. I'd rather not tell you an answer that I don't know but I can get you the answer. Yeah, and um, I'm happy to sort of that. My email yeah, that, is um, really easy to find out. It's adam.chapman at sas.ac.uk. And if there's any other queries that, about this uh, talk, then I'll well, happy to say that Mark, uh, Angus Winchester is involved in the MDR on its advisory board and uh, uh, is giving next week's training session oh, with Sue good. Houston. So if you come along next week, you can ask him that question because he might <laughs> stand a better chance of knowing the answer. Yeah, I've got a, stand, got a question from Pam Fisher. And I thank you very much. Um, it was a very interesting talk. My question is really if whether you can say anything about the actual process of sealing royal grants, because the calendar of the patent rolls talks about a, a grant that's given on a certain date and in a certain place. If that yeah. place has no royal palace or something, you know, is it the king that's there or the chancellor or what's going on? I sort of yeah. envisage a man on horseback sort of knowing the king's going from A to B and sort of chasing him up and saying, can you deal with this, sir? You're absolutely right. It's a very good question. And I think it's there's an itinerary drawn up by Caroline Shenton for Edward III, where she has yeah. three separate columns for where the king is, where the great seal is, and where it's one of the other seals, a wardrobe seal, I think. And so the, the process of like, as far as I understand it, the most recent research suggests that the date of a letter's patent, say, is the date that the warrant was issued, not the date that the letter was given to the individual. So if, if, if a document is dated in the calendar of patent rolls by a certain date, that relates to the date of the warrant, not when somebody collected it or paid the fee for the, for the enrolment, mm. I think. So a lot of the time, of course, that would be in Westminster, but occasionally, of course, it wouldn't be. So mm. yeah, I think you're right, there will be occasions where you know, muddy field yeah. horseback riders are involved, and and certainly the the warrants under the, and the things like the secret seal and the privy seal in, in their earlier um, manifestations, there would have had to been a lot of that iteration across the country. And so I think you can I mean, often you can calculate from I think the things like um, inquisitions post mortem, for example, you can because it tells you the date when the writ was issued and the date when it was received, 
in Chancery or by, by, the, by the officials who hold the Inquisition, you can actually track how quickly royal messengers or ministers traveled with their documentation. And so you're right, it would have, there would have been a lot of that going on. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just asking, because I'm doing working for the VCH at the moment on history of Lutterworth, oh, and there's a good. patent for all, um, there's a grant issued, signed it, sealed in Lutterworth, and I just sort of, I know the King really? was in Coventry the day before, and I just sort of oh. imagine this guy going along horseback on Long Watling Street and saying to the, finding the King and sort of saying, can you deal with this? But, well, yeah, that, I mean, that suggests that the, well, the, uh, the warrant must have been issued or at some point in Lutterworth then, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that 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 doesn't seem implausible because well, because you know what what year did you say that was? I can't recall. I think it's fifteenth century. Okay. Mm. okay. I mean, um, yeah. So to, and the Caroline Shenton volume uh, Paul mentioned is in the List and Index Society series is, yeah. from two thousand and seven. It covers yeah. not not the whole reign of Edward III, but thirteen twenty seven to thirteen forty five. Yeah, but it does it does give a good introduction but, yeah. to the pro some of the processes. Yeah. Thank um, you. And those Listen Index Society volumes, if you can get hold of them, if you can access, I mean, they're good, good they're, most academic libraries carry them, are uh, well worth looking at, not yeah. just for the content, but also, as Paul suggested, the introductions there. Uh, well, I've done two of them, so. Yeah, well, I mean, I didn't like to say. <laughs> <laughs> on advanced wool contracts, wasn't it? <laughs> one, was, one was on wool, yeah, one was on Irish Inquisition to an extent, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, a, a varied palette, I think it's fair to say. Oh, yes. Thank you very um, much. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Board, you're silly, I don't know. Sure, that's not true. Um, so, um, if that that being the case, oh, hang on, something appeared in the chat. Uh, oh, yes, listening to society link has just appeared in the chat. So, um, I can, um, recommend checking that out if there's any particular theme you're interested in. So, um, thank you. I think at that point, we should wrap up and thank Paul again for his uh, really informative, really rich, and uh, incredibly useful. Um, talk on the content of the medieval records and the early, and written the best out of search facility in the National Archives. Um, if you if you're free at the same time next week, we'll be having uh, two experts and uh, I mean and people who are genuine experts in their field, just as Paul is, uh, Professor Sue Eastison and uh, Professor Angus Winchester, who we've already mentioned. We're we'll talking about um, the development of settlement and its study, um, which should be a really fantastic session, um, just as this was. So. Um, Thank you, everybody, for giving up your afternoon. It's been really appreciated and been really interesting. And if you'd like to maybe give clap Paul on his way, that would be fantastic. Do do sign up for Amanda's when when it's when yes. you've agreed the date because Amanda is far more knowledgeable than I could ever be. <laughs> uh, okay, so and uh, we'll let you know when that's when that's going to be. Um, I need to re I need to renegotiate that. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. That's been really really good. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks all.